Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, it's Sunday, it's Sunday and it's 7 o'clock. Who knows that the blood still works? Who knows, who knows, who knows? The blood still works, the blood still works. It works. Who know that the blood still works? Miss Patricia, I know you know that the blood still works. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, Tiffany, we know that the blood still works, Tiff. We know that the blood still works. We see your baby, Lord. We see the baby. We see the baby. Good morning, Adia. Good morning, good morning. The blood still works. Hey, Katina, good morning. Come on, we're going to pray the Lord this morning. Hey, Miss Janetta, the blood still works. The blood still works. Hey, Leonette, good morning. Good morning, Miss Teresa. It will never. Hey, Miss Evelyn, good morning. Losing power. The blood still works. Good morning, Miss Brenda. Good morning, Miss Linda. Hey, Miss Evelyn. I know it works. You know it worked because it saved you, right? You know it worked because it healed you. Hey, Miss Cher. Hey, Keita. Never lose his power. The blood still works. Hey, Dom. Good morning, Crystal. Good morning, Miss Tita. I know it works. I know it works. Come on, y'all. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Get up. Get up. Get up. The blood still works. Lose this power. Hey, mother in love. Hey, Miss Sonia. The blood still works, y'all. The blood still works. The blood still works. The blood still works. Hey, Michelle. The blood still works. The blood still works. Good morning, Shanika. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Miss Victoria. The blood still works. Oh, yes. The blood still works. The blood still works. Come on, where my outdoors at? I know the blood still works. Oh yeah, the blood still works. Good morning, Keisha. Good morning, hey Uncle Chuck. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey Miss Deborah. Hey y'all, the blood still works. Never, it never loses power, y'all. It never loses power. It's still healing. It's still saving, angel. It's still delivering. The blood still works. The blood still works. Hey, Peaches. Hey, Bonnie. The blood still works, Miss Jackie. Hey, Aretha. Hey, she. Hey, Miss Jewel, good morning, good morning, good morning. I am so excited that the blood still works. It reaches the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. Come on, good morning, good morning, good morning. The blood still works, Tamika. The blood still works, Tanya. The blood still works, Miss Evelyn. The blood still works, Miss Angela. The blood still works, Danica. The blood still works. Good morning, good morning, good morning. <coughs> my my voice is sounding crazy. And I feel all right. I don't know why my voice sounds like this. Well, blood, the blood of Jesus is on my throat. <clears> throat. Hallelujah. I'm so excited this morning because God reminded me that the blood still works and that it will never lose its power, Miss Sandra. It will never lose its power, I share. It will never. 
loses power. It still saves. It still delivers. It still sets free. It still removes you from bondage. It still takes you out of your issues. It still um it still clears a, a mind of doubt. It still gives you what you need. It still holds you in the midnight hour. It still wipe away the tears from your eyes. The blood still works, Miss Pamela. The blood still works, Letty. The blood still works, Peaches. The blood still works. I'm so excited. I just want to remind you today that if you're feeling low, if you feel like you can't make it, if you feel like you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, if you just don't, if you need an answer, I want you to know that the answer is in the blood. It's in the blood. It's in the blood. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. SGS ministry with your girl, Reverend Rashida Lee. I'm so excited this morning because the blood still works. And I'm just so thankful because we had an awesome, awesome, awesome opportunity to be in the presence of Kiara Shears last Sunday. And it was an amazing time. If you was not there, if you ain't have an opportunity to come, I hope you had a chance to see it on YouTube or on my Facebook page. My YouTube page is Reverend R.E.V. Rashida Lee or my YouTube page is Rashida Carter Myers Lee. You have to, have to, have to go watch it. It was so amazing. The anointing was in the place. And I'm telling you, Kiara spoke into my life. I felt like she was sitting next to me. She was speaking exactly to me. She said, I, I had to realize that I don't have to apologize no more for greatness. I don't have to apologize, Miss Brenda, no more. I don't have to be guilty no more for nothing. I don't have to hold no guilt over my head. She also reminded us that the word future... This was so amazing when she said this. She said the word future, her and her girlfriend was talking. And she said the word future was the definition was a sequence of events that you have spoken. A set of events that have followed what you have spoken into the atmosphere. Your future is because of your words. Is that amazing that what you were speaking at 14 and 15 and 16 is now a result in your life today? And what can happen in your future now that's coming to pass, it could be by the result of what you say today. What are you speaking over your life? I mean, she blessed my soul. I said, what am I speaking? What am I saying about myself? What am I talking when I'm saying to my friends? What am I saying about my own life? What am I saying about my children? What am I saying about my business? What am I saying about my finances? Am I always saying I'm broke? Am I always saying I'm tired? Am I always saying, oh my God, I'm so fat? What are you speaking? You got to speak life. She's, I mean, she spoke, she didn't even, I felt like she was talking to me, y'all. I'm telling you, I'm just being honest. I felt like she was saying, Rashida, what are you speaking? And I was so excited after I left there. I, I'm still so rejuvenated because I realized, even though I already knew it, but it just made it so much more magnified that we have to speak that we are healed. We have to speak that we are magnificent. We got to speak that we're marvelous. We got to speak that I'm, I'm not, I'm out of poverty. I'm not in debt. You got to speak those things. You got to say, I am in shape. I am healthy. I am covered. I am forgiven. I am prosperous. You got to speak that you are rich, that you are retired and you're not unhealthy. Don't be retired and unhealthy. You got to speak those things over your life. You got to speak that I'm not sick, that I'm no longer um, abused. You have to speak those things. You got to speak that I am a loving person, that I am kind, that I am friendly, that I am a conqueror, that I am an overachiever. You got to speak life to yourself. Speak it to your future. It might not be what you are today, but you got to speak later on what you want. Now, my daughter is in a program called Journey Unveiled and Miss Jamila Smith, well, Dr. Jamila Smith, she teaches the children to have an I am statement. Who are you? Now, my daughter is 16, but she's preparing her for her future to say, I am great. I am amazing. I am. You got to speak those things. Like, even as an adult, we have to speak those things as though they were. Come on. Kiara Shears, she blessed my soul. My girlfriend, Dom, she said to me when I was doing her hair yesterday, she said, she, I'm still feeling it. She's still feeling the remnants. Of what the lady spoke over us in song. She ministered. So I just hope that if you was there. And you you really was there to expect something. That you received a word. That your future is the result of your words. So what are you speaking over your life? I'm excited. Dave. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. 
And I was excited to see my girlfriend, Keisha. I haven't seen her in so long. I was so excited to see her at the service. So I'm just so thankful for all of y'all that did participate and, you know, take the time to come, to press through, to come out, to be able to witness. You know, November 2018 was my very first service at <clears throat> the Leak Center. And the young lady, Tia Pittman, well, T Tia Cherie, her last name isn't even Pittman anymore. When she sang at my very first conference, she spoke so many things over my life that day. And she said that we will be exactly where we was at last Sunday. And when she was there, I didn't even know she was coming last Sunday to sing. And I said, Tia, do you remember you spoke those words over me back in 2018? She said, I remember every word I say. I said, you know, I've been to Jerusalem since then. I've been to England preaching since then. I have been able to speak in different churches since then. I said, God has been blessing me. And she said, she said I remember word for word. And guess what? The words that she planted in my life back in 2018 manifested in 2021. You got to plant word seeds. You can't just plant, you just can't constantly think you can just say stuff and it's, it's not going to happen. The word you speak is going to happen. You activate the earth with your words. You say you're broke, you will be broke. You have that much power in your tongue. And I was so excited to see her to say, look what God has done. He gave us what we spoke. I said, my past is erased. He erased my past to prepare me for my future. That was my word back in 2018. And he prepared me for that day. And guess what? We all was able to witness. So we have to plant word seeds. Plant them word seeds in your life. Whatever is not happening right now that you want to happen, plant it today. Somebody say today. We're going to plant them words today. When you get off this live, you're going to go and write down some affirmations. You're going to write down what you want God to do in your life. You want when you want to write down what you want to see in your life today. Somebody say amen. Amen. So we are in our healing series. This is the last day of our healing series. And I'm so excited because my girlfriend Tanya called me. She called me like three weeks ago. And I was in um I was in Baltimore and I was in the car driving and she said, she I just got to tell you something. I'm on my way inside the doctors and I got a, a report. I got a report from the doctor that wasn't so great. And she said, but because of you testifying on today, it was on a Sunday. She said, because you testified and said that God had blessed you, blessed you with, from the bleed and in, you know, at the surgery that you had. She said, God, I know that God's going to heal me. Right. And she was in the car with her husband. She was like, me and my husband, we watch you on Sunday mornings. She said, we so excited when we watch you. She said, but when you testified, when you said that God blessed you, I knew he could bless me too. And she said, I'm not worried about my report. I'm not worried about it. She said, but God is going to bless me. Do you know that she had a report about cancer? That they had did a, a report for her and that they said they seen cancer in her body. Well, she texted me on Wednesday, this Wednesday. And said, I want to let you know that the report has changed. Come on, somebody. This was three weeks ago. She said the report has changed now. I, she texted me on Wednesday. I just seen it four o'clock this morning when I was up studying for service today. And when I was up studying, the, the Lord reminded me that I never responded to her text because I never even opened it. I had so many text messages, I never even opened it. But the Lord reminded me to go back and look at Tanya's text. And when I looked at it, I'm like, oh my God. She spoke what she believed. She received my testimony for her own life and spoke it over her own self. And God blessed her with a good report. Somebody say a good report. This is why you got to testify because your testimony will bless somebody else's life. This woman and her children, her daughter was so nervous at my salon. She was telling Sharon how they were so nervous for the report. But Tanya was already convinced that God had blessed Rashida. So if he can bless Rashida, he can bless me too. She was not worried. Come on. The Bible say don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. You got to believe in the word. He said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you can wish and ask for anything and it shall happen for you. She abide in the word. She studies the word. She come to SGS Bible study in the morning. So this, listen to me. If you believe, all it takes is belief. That's all it takes. 
She said, I believe because if he did it for you, he'd do it for me. And guess what? Her report is clear. Come on. He's healing during the healing service. What? He's healing during our healing series, y'all. I know you got a testimony. I know you do. My girlfriend, let me tell y'all. Oh, my God. I, I got to get to the lesson. I can't tell y'all all the, the testimonies that I've been getting. But that was amazing to me this morning when I was up studying. So I'm just excited that all we got to do is believe. Somebody say, I believe. That's all we got to do. It's just, it's that simple. Two words. I believe. Are we, I'm going to read something in the Bible today with um, our lesson about one of, one of the fathers that wanted his child to be healed. So let's go to Luke chapter 9, verse 37 to 43. Now I'm going to read this, um, this passage and I'm going to read it from all three versions. I'm going to read it from the book of Luke. I'm going to read it from the book of Mark and I'm going to read it from the book of Matthew. And I want you to see how everybody's um, story was a slightly different. However, they all told the same story, but I want, to, want you to see how they all told a slightly different story. Because I want you to see that Luke, when he told the story, Luke is not a disciple. So Luke was one of the followers of Christ. He was a physician. He was a doctor. So Luke, he always revealed the compassion of Christ. When he taught of the word, he always um, taught of the, the compassion of Christ. Now, Mark, he wasn't a disciple as either, but he was also a follower. Now, Matthew, he was a tax collector, but he was a disciple. So all three of these gospels, they all told the story of Jesus Christ. However, they were all, um, they all had slightly different words that was attached to their story. So let's start at Luke, Luke chapter nine, verse 37 to 43. Luke chapter nine, verse 37 to 43. And it says, oh, wait a minute. Let me, let's pray. Most gracious and eternal father, we bless your holy and righteous name. Father, forgive us for our sins, recognizing that we come short of the glory every single day. Father, we thank you that the blood still works, that it reaches the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley, that it saves, that it heals, that it delivers, that it sets us free. Father, we thank you for the blood, that it covers a multitude of sins. So, Father, today, let the Holy Spirit move in every household. Let the Holy Spirit move even for those that come on the live later on today, God. I ask you to touch them. I ask you to heal them. I ask you to deliver them. Father, whatever they need, I ask you to show up. Like never before, loose, heal, deliver, and set free in the name of Jesus. Now, God, I ask you to touch my lips, my lips of clay. Father, mold me. Father, allow me to be decreased that you are increased. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the people of God say amen, amen, and amen. I got to put my glasses on. Amen, amen, amen. So Luke chapter nine, verse four, 37 to 43. And it says the next day when they came down from the mountain, now they were coming down from the mountain from the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus Christ was transfigured on the mountain. He had with him, Peter, James, and John. And when he came down off the mountain, he came, he left nine of the disciples down at the bottom of the mountain. So the, the three that was up with him was seeing amazement. They were seeing the glory happen right before their eyes. But when they came down off the mountain, they seen confusion. It was the Pharisees. It was the, the rulers. And it was also followers of Christ. And it was also people that was willing to get healed. And they were all at the bottom of the mountain. Now they just came from glory. They just came from a high mountain. And now they're coming down to the valley where all these people are. They're arguing. They're going back and forth. They're talking. You know, and, and a, a couple people are frustrated because they want healing. And they're trying to get healing from the disciples because they know that they have power because they've been with Christ. However, this particular time, they were unable to perform. Somebody said they were unable to perform. So they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, teacher, I beg you to look at my son for he is my only child. Why did he make that, a, make that very um, noticeable that it was his only child? A lot of us have on, only children. It's our only seed that we produce. And 
You be so connected. Like, this is my only child. Please don't take my only child. This is all I have. And he was grieving that his only child needed help. And I need you to know that it's, it's all I have. This is it. I don't have no other children. If this child dies, I don't have no other child. So I need you to understand that this is my only child and he needs help. I don't know about you, but some of y'all on here have your only child and your only child has been in so much pain, has been in so much distress. They need God and you are desperate for the Lord and you just cry out, Lord, this is my only child and I need help. Or you might have three children or two children and you say, these are all I have. These are my love children. You make it plain. You are specific about what you're asking God. And you say, I need you to understand that what I'm asking you, I need you to know, to know that this is all I have. And I'm desperate for you to bless him. That's how you got to come to God. You got to give him the specifics. He was specific. Like, I need you to know. When I speak to God about Veda and I speak to God about Zyla, I say, you know. That I did this and you know what I've done. And you know who this child is to me. You know what she means to me. You got to talk to him like you know that he don't know. It goes on to say a spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. Now he has a child that is literally having demon possessed. The demon um, possessions inside of him that is really throwing him here and there. And giving him convulsions. He's shaking. He's moving. And he's foaming at the mouth as if he's dying. This parent is watching their child go through a situation that they can't do nothing about. No doctor can help him. All he knows is that Jesus has been healing people prior to. And I need you to help me. It says it scarcely ever leaves him. So that means every month or every week this is happening to his child. And it is destroying him. Do you know that when your children are in pain, you're in pain? I don't know about any mothers that's on here, or any fathers that's on here. But even a, a, a person that's on here that take care of their nieces or nephews, it's nothing like seeing your child go through and you can't do nothing about it. You can't help them. It never leaves them. You're waiting for something to break. You're waiting for a change in them. And it just don't change. It's constantly happening to them. You see the enemy on their life. And you just want to just shake it out of them. You just want something to happen. But the God, this man in this book, he said to God, I know you can help. He was that, I mean, he was that um sure that God could do it. And he said, I begged your disciples to drive it out. He like, I need help. I'm begging them to drive it out, but they could not. That's like you begging the deacons for help. You're begging the ministers at the church for help, but you like, pastor, I need you. I know you busy, but I need you to do it. I need you to lay hands. I need you to pray over us. I need you to come. This is what's happening today in this story. He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Now he was talking at this time to the disciples because he left them down there to do the work. I'm going to tell you why. Let's go to Mark chapter six, verse 13. Let's go to Mark chapter six, verse 13, real quick. Mark chapter six, verse 13. It says, I'm going to start from verse one real quick. Mark chapter six, verse one to 13. It says, then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him, the 12 disciples. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. He gave them what? Authority. So they now have the power. In Mark chapter six, he gave them the power to drive out impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Where Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. Verse 13, they drove out 
many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So we know that the disciples had the power to drive out the devil out of these people. And these people came, this large crowd came for that to happen. So they knew they had the power because they seen it happening. So we have proof that they have power to drive out the demons. But this man, this father said, I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. So Jesus said to them, you unbelieving perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here, he says to the man. He's letting the disciples know and the crowd, I can't stay with you forever. You have to use the power that I am giving you and you have to use it to your authority. You got to use the authority that I'm giving you. But guess what? You need power to do that. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Now, I want to go to um, Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 to 21. I want to read the other, other version of the same story. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 to 21. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 to 21. It says, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Now this version says that he knelt before God. Now the other version didn't say that. Knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. Now you see the difference in the disciples' version of the story? It says he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Now, Luke couldn't tell this part because when they went to Christ, they were in private. So this is why Luke was unable to give this version of the story. He replied, because you have so little faith. Do you see that the faith is what drives out the demons? The faith is what allows you to heal, to deliver and set free with the power that's in your hands. It's the faith. It says, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. This is what Jesus said to the disciples. That if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to any mountain, what mountain do you have in your life? You can speak to that mountain and because of your faith as small as a mustard seed, you will be able to move that mountain instantly. Nothing will be impossible for you. What do you need from God today? If you have faith, you will be able to remove that demon out of your child. You will be able to remove that demon or that issue or that pain or that financial distress or that relationship. You can move it because of your faith. Being as small as a mustard seed. And it will not be impossible for you. The Bible says in King James Version. The same verse, Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 to 24. 
It, it says the same thing, but it actually adds to it. It says, how be it does this kind does not go out except by fasting and praying. That's what the King James Virgin says. So it's a little bit more to the, to that scripture. Jesus also said to them that this kind can only come out by fasting and praying. Well, what happened? Jesus, Peter, James, and John just came off the mountain from the transfiguration. So they were fasting. They were praying in the presence of God. And when they came down, the power was so immense that when he spoke to the demon, the demon released himself from the boy. Some things only come after fasting and praying. You can't expect a miracle to happen if you don't have faith as small as a mustard seed. You have not prayed and you have not fasted. Prayer is you speaking to God about your situation. You have to have full dependence on Christ. You got to give it all to him. You got to cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. You got to throw it on him. You got to let him know that I can't handle it no more. I can't take it no more. I don't know what I'm doing. I need you. It's your child. And all I need you to do is to change it. And because that child is made in the image and the faithfulness of God, he will do it. But it's your faith. It's your belief. This kind does not come, but only by fasting and praying. I know some people say, Rashidi, y'all fast too much. I know Rashidi, y'all fast too much. Rashidi, y'all fast too much. I mean, I couldn't believe it when the girl said I fast too much. But I'm telling you that sometimes you got to deny this flesh so that your spirit can rise. So God can know that you only are dependent on him. And you want to hear a sound you want to hear his voice. You want to get clarity from Christ himself. And it takes from you to be able to deny this flesh with food, with physical food, so you can have spiritual food. You want an answer? You want an answer for your child? You want to an answer for your grandchild. You want to an answer for your life. You want to an answer for your finances. You want to an answer for death. You want to an answer for loneliness. You want to an answer for your ministry. You want to an answer for your marriage. You want to an answer for your relationship. You want to an answer for your house. You want to an answer for your business. You need to fast and pray and have faith and believe. You ain't going to get no answer no other way. This father came and knelt at Jesus' feet. Jesus is no longer walking on the earth. He lives inside of us. He resides inside of us. And you got to activate this thing. You got to activate him inside of you. All you got to do, Dom, is turn down your plate. Don't eat nothing. And how bad do you want it? Just stop eating. And God will give you exactly what you need. You don't got to learn how to fast. Fasting is taking away the food from your lips. It's denying the flesh. It might not be food. It might be a drug. It might be an addiction. It might be something that is so immense in your life. And all you got to do is just retract yourself from it. And say, I will deny this flesh so that my spirit can rise. It's a vertical thing. It's vertical. How bad do you want it? Come on. How bad do you want it? I got to fast. It's necessary for me. I have no other choice. Let's go on. Let's go to Mark chapter 9, verse 14 to 29. Now, this is Mark's version. Mark chapter 9, verse 14 to 29. I was so amazed at how these stories are, are slightly different, but they all, everything that Jesus Christ said, was said, was given differently by each person. Let's go to Mark chapter 9, verse 14 to 29. It says, when they came to the other disciples, that was nine of them, the other disciples, it was nine disciples left at the bottom of the mountain. They saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Now here go the part where Mark shares that the teachers of the law, the, the synagogue leaders, were now arguing with the disciples and the people that was down there, the, the crowd. As soon as all 
the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Now, we know that he was transfigured on the mountain, so he looked different. Come on, somebody. They knew who he was, but the wonder, the glory was over him. It was overshadowing him. The Bible says that he was clean. He was whiter than snow on the mountain. So he probably was looking like glory. Oh, my God. They ran to greet him. Verse 16, Jesus says, what are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Now, one virgin say he has robbed him of speech. The other virgin says he has seizures and the other virgin says he has demons inside of him. That he has convulsions, convulsions, and he's foaming at the mouth. So all of them have different versions of this story. However, they all knew that he brought him to Christ. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. Now look how every single one is just totally different. That's why you need to study to show yourself approved. You got to study the word. You got to study the word of God. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Verse 19, you unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Do you notice that every single one of them said the same exact thing that Jesus said? That everything that was in red, they did not change the wording at all. So they all heard what Jesus said, but they all seen the story differently. But they did not change the wording that Jesus said. It says, so they brought him. When the spirit saw it, now this right here, this version says, when the spirit saw Jesus. Come on. The spirit has power. Y'all got to know that the spirit is that powerful. The spirit recognizes you. That's why spirit recognize spirit. That's why you can be with people that are like you and you can feel the spirit of God on them. And you can also feel the spirit of the devil on people. Come on. The spirit recognizes Christ inside of you. And when the spirit recognizes Christ inside of you, they hate you. That spirit is real. That spirit resonates in the earth. Oh my God. Somebody say the devil, the devil, the devil. They looking at the devil like he got big horns and he red. The devil is the spirit and that spirit has power. And when that spirit comes into your space and it's not God like it will hate you. That's why you can go back and forth with somebody that has demonic spirits inside of them because their spirit is full of the enemy and the enemy will always try to attack you and it will attack you because it don't have Christ inside of it. So that's why you have to be careful with the spirits that you're connecting to because those spirits will drive out the enemy inside. You have to be careful who you are around. Oh my God, I know you want to be with her. I know you want to be with him. But the enemy is inside of them and they will hate you regardless of how great you are. How amazing you are. How much you love Christ. They hate you because you love Christ. And guess what? They will make you feel bad. It's the spirit inside of them. That spirit has power. The spirit saw Jesus. It immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. So he's playing with the devil. The devil, the devil playing with the boy. He like, oh, I'm, I'm going to tear him up now. Now you want, you want Christ? Your dad wants you to get healed? I'm going to really tear you up. That's why we, you got to know that we wrestle against, not just against flesh and blood, but against rules and principalities. We wrestle against the, the, the um, higher, it, it, it's an a enemy that lives higher in the earth, and it has power. You can't play with this thing. You cannot play with it. Oh, I love the Lord. The Lord loves me. You got to know the higher you go, the higher the devil will attack you. The, the greater you are in the word, the more you're studying, the more the, the greater the attack will be. Because he has power. 
And when you're speaking things, you're speaking into the atmosphere where the spirit lives. He lives in the earth. So if you are speaking it, he attaches those words to your life. You got to be careful with your speaking in the earth. Because he has power. It says he fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? Nobody else said that in none of the other scriptures, but God wanted to know the specifics. He wanted to know every detail about your situation. He wanted to know everything. Don't just bring me your situation. Tell me everything. Come to me naked. I want it raw and uncut. I want it raw. He said from childhood, he answered. So he said, it's been since a baby. All his life, he's been going through this. I've been suffering with him. As he's suffering, I'm suffering. So God wanted to know, what are you going through for real? I will help you, but I got to know the whole story. It has often drove, thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, he said, but if you can do anything, Take pity on us and help us. Now he went from asking God to help his son to now helping us. I don't need you to just help my child. I need you to help me because I'm suffering too. He don't suffer alone. We're suffering together. So when you praying for your family, tell God, I'm not only praying for me, I'm praying for my family too. Everything that's attached to me. I want you to bless not just them, bless me too in the midst. He said, have pity on us. Verse 40, verse 23 says, if you can, Jesus said, you asking me if I can, what do you mean if I can? Jesus said, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes the guy the father knew that Jesus could do it, but he like, if you can just do it, I know your disciples can't do it. I know nobody down here can do it. I know the priests can't do it. I know that the, the, um, the, the, the synagogue leaders can't do it. But if you can, he like, I am God. I can do all things. But if you believe everything is possible, come on. Everything is possible, Katrina. Everything is possible, Miss Evelyn. Everything is possible, Adia. Everything is possible, Miss Millicent. Everything is possible if you believe. My girlfriend Tanya believed. And it was possible for her to get a good report. It says, immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And that's the part right there. He believed enough to drop down to his feet. He believed enough to go where the crowd was going. He believed to go to the mountain. He believed to take his son. He believed enough to say, I'm not taking it no more. However, he said, I believe, but I have a little bit of unbelief. I believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. That's like us. We believe that God can do it, but we still have that little bit of unbelief. And we need to ask God to help me to overcome my unbelief. That's where it's at. It's right there. It's at that moment where you say to yourself, God, I do believe. I'm sorry if I'm unbelieving. I'm sorry if I can't overcome that unbelief, but I need you to help me with my unbelief. Help me overcome that thing. I don't want to be shaky in my faith. I don't want to be um, at the point where I'm like, did I do right? Did I do wrong? I don't understand. I'm not sure. I want to be start. I want to be straightforward. I want to make sure that I know that I know that I know that you will, that it's possible with you. But that's where you got to believe and say, God, I want you to over help me overcome my unbelief. Because a lot of us have unbelief because we're not sure. But I decree and declare today that you will be sure that it's possible with Christ. 
that all things are possible. When you want your child healed, you will believe like, a, like you have a mustard seed in your hand. A mustard seed is so small you can barely see it. But you will have so much belief that you will move that mountain and you will drag your child to the altar. You will drag your child to God. You will drag your child to church. You will drag and pour the oil on them and say, I believe. I believe. I believe. You got to believe that God can do it like he did it for this child. The, the father was willing to be honest that I know I've been shaky in my faith. I know I've been coming to church here and there. I know I've been on our live every now and then. I know I haven't been fasting the way I should. I know I haven't been praying every night. I know I haven't been studying every night. But God, I believe you. It's okay to be at a place where you have unbelief. But all you got to do is be like this father and say, but I believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. That's good. All he wanted to do is be raw and uncut. And say, Father, I can't take it no more. It's all too much. It hurts. I'm in pain. I don't know what to do. I can't help my child no more. But I need you. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Not next month. Not next year. I need you now. He says, when Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You got to rebuke that thing out of your child. You got to rebuke that thing out of your finances. You got to rebuke that thing out of your job, out of your household, out of your relationship. You got to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And it will flee. It says, you deaf and mute spirit. Speak to the spirit. He said, I command you. You got to command. You got to declare and decree on the thing. You got to speak to it. That's what command means. It means to speak to it with authority. Even Jesus spoke to the spirit with authority. He said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. He was specific. Don't just come out, but don't come back. Come on. That's good. Don't come out only, but don't even come back. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? Verse 29 says he replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. What is your prayer life like? What are you asking your father? What are you saying to your daddy? What are you talking to your Abba about? He's ready to listen. He's ready to hear you. He's waiting for your tears. He's waiting for you to beg. He's waiting for you to lay out and prostrate. He's waiting for you. With arms open wide, he's waiting for you. Prayer is just communication. Communicate with your daddy. Communicate and let him know the specifics. I love how each chapter was broken down differently. And each time, Christ showed himself even the more. You got to pray specifically for what you want. Let's go on. Let's go to, oh my God. Hallelujah. The funny thing about this, this, um, this uh, text is that the religious people, they seen the miracle. So they was around Christ. They, they made sure they was always in the crowd. The religious folk. The amazing part is they don't have enough faith to call on him. Religious people, they want to be around the glory, but they don't have enough faith to call on him. Believers, you have to call on him. You want to be around them. You want to be in the midst. You want to be with the corporate anointing. You got to not just be there. You got to use your power in your words. Let's go to Luke chapter seven. First verse 11 to 16. I have two more scriptures that I want to finish up. So I might go over a little teeny bit. Luke chapter seven, verse 11 to 16. Luke chapter 11, chapter seven. I'm sorry. Chapter seven, verse 11 to 16. 
I'm excited. Jesus, Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 16. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain. This is the only time this story was recorded. It was in the book of Luke. It was not recorded in no other book. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. Now, when Luke told stories about Christ, he always shared and revealed his compassion. I told you all that earlier. And he wanted people to see how compassionate Christ was. It says, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. Now, it was a funeral procession. So they was carrying the, the, um, the casket out of the church or out of the synagogue. And Jesus Christ noticed it. He witnessed it. It says, the only son of his mother. Here we go again with the specifics. This is the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. Now, it's giving you very two great details. That was her only child and her husband had died. Now, if her husband died, that means her wages have now been cut. Because the women stayed home to take care of the children. And the husband worked. Now, when the husband died, the children then are the breadwinner. Now, this son was the overseer of the house because the father had died. Now that the father is dead and now the son is dead, this woman, which is now a widow, will now be literally um, become a beggar. In those times when you didn't have a son or a husband, you was, re you was pushed to beg and you were pushed to prostitute. You were pushed to be enslaved and you were pushed to be um, a maid in somebody's house. And the Lord seen this. He's seen all of that. That's why it's so um, crucial that you know the details. When God knows the details of your life, he will tolerate just for you. Come on, somebody. Say, make it tailor made just for me. My story ain't like her story. My story ain't like his story. This woman's story was different than anybody's story because her husband died and her child had died. It says... And a large crowd from the town was with her. So that lets us know that she was a well-loved person. The people in the town loved her. They were at the funeral with her. They was comforting her. They was at the, the, the um, funeral. And when the Lord saw her, somebody say, Lord, see me. See my story. See my situation. The Lord saw her. His heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. He seen her, his heart of compassion, his heart of love, his heart of mercy fell on her. He was so overwhelmed at who what was going on with her that he said to her, don't cry. He seen the pain in her eyes and he said, don't cry. So I imagine when he was saying, don't cry, he probably was hugging her. He probably was touching her hands. He probably was wiping the tears from her eyes. He probably was rubbing her head. What was he doing in that moment? When you tell somebody don't cry, you immediately go to embrace them. Then he went up and touched the beer. The beer was a stretcher that was like a casket. And they were carrying him on it. He went to touch that. He never touched the boy at this point. He touched the stretcher and the barrier stood still. Now we know that we have the funeral barriers. The guys that carry the casket is always your cousins or your uncles. So they had people carrying the casket. It was a stretcher. They had people carrying it. And when he touched it, when Jesus touched it, they immediately stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. Oh my God. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. 
They said a great prophet has appeared among us. They said God has come to help his people. Somebody said God has come to help his people. God will not leave you in the situation that you are in. He has come to touch your stretcher. If you're in a dead state, if you're in a dead situation, he has come to touch your stretcher and tell you to get up so that you can talk again, so that you can live again, so that you can rise again. God has come to help his people. He will not leave you like that. He will not leave you astray. He will not leave you lonely. He will not leave you sad. He will not leave you worried about your children. He will not leave you destitute. He will not leave you broke and lonely and upset and crying. He won't leave you like that. He's come to give you help. And help is on the way. Stop thinking that he's leaving you alone. God got your back. He has your back. He has your back. He has your back. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but God has come to help his people. You are his people. You on this line today, you are his people. He's come to extend his hand to you. The same way he helped this widow and her child. Oh my God. And he showed the people in the town the miracle. You got to tell people when God sends a miracle. You cannot be afraid because somebody else needs to be encouraged. God is coming for you. He has come to help you. He will not leave you or your child dead. He will not leave them in that situation. He will not leave them crying. He will not leave them alone. He will not leave them homeless. He will not leave them on the street. He will not leave them begging for bread. He will not. But you got to believe it. This woman was crying for help. She was sad that she was about to be begging. But God said, I have compassion on my children. I will not see you in your state at that long, no longer. He's coming to help you. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countries. Somebody say amen. I got one more scripture, then we're done the healing series. Let's go to John chapter 4, verse 46 to 54. John chapter 4, verse 46 to 54. John chapter 4, verse 46 to 54. The very short story. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Once more, he visited Canaan and Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. Now, we know that when he turned the water into wine, that was his very first miracle. And it was in the Canaan of Galilee. That was Jesus' first miracle. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. Now, you see how specific the story is. It lets us know that this royal official, he is a ruler. That means he had people that's under him and he has no power to heal his own child, but he has power as a royal official. I don't care how great your job is. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care what position you are in. I don't care how beautiful you are. I don't care what you have, what degree you have. No amount of power that you have on earth if you don't have Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit inside of you, you cannot heal, you cannot deliver, you cannot lay hands because you don't have the power of God inside of you. You have to have the power from Christ to do anything. And you have to have faith to believe that it will happen. So this royal official whose son lay sick, when he heard when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him. Now, I'm not talking to y'all on here because y'all always on here. So I'm not telling y'all to come to Jesus because y'all always on here. Y'all come to hear a word. Y'all come to study. Y'all come whenever I say come out to volunteer. Y'all come when I say give an offering. Y'all give it. Whatever I say, y'all do. Y'all listen to the word of God. And y'all listen because of the... the the um, spirit that lays on me through Jesus Christ. 
not because of Rashida, but because of the spirit that lays on my life. And you preparing yourself for what God has for you because you always come to Christ. You go to church when church is open. You go to the choir practice. You go to usher and service. You do whatever you need to do to get in his presence. I'm talking to those that are on here that are on here consistently. And because of that, I'm saying to you that when you need Christ, when you want Christ, you will get up at seven o'clock. You will sit up in bed. You will prepare yourself for Bible study. You will prepare yourself to look pretty for church. You will prepare yourself to look beautiful for the king. You will get yourself together in the morning for you to go to the house of God to prepare to pray, to prepare to receive, to prepare to expect God. Amen. Those that are willing to get something from God and to expect God, you have to go to him. You got to make an effort. To go to him. Now this royal official was sitting on his throne. He did not have to move. He did not have to do a thing. He could have told one of his servants to go to Christ and bring him back to his palace. But he got up. Moved his feet on behalf of his child. Because he heard that Jesus was in the vicinity of him. Now I don't know about you. But if I heard that Jesus blessed her. And I heard that Jesus is giving out blessings to him. And I heard that Jesus is giving out businesses and jobs and relationships. And, and he's healing people's children. I'm going to go where he's at. And if he's on Facebook Live, if he's on YouTube, if he's at that church down there, if he's at the church in, in New York, if he's at the church in Atlanta, if he's at the church in Miami, I'm going to where I heard he's at. And that's what you have to do. You got to get up. And be prepared to receive the word. And you got to go. You can't keep making excuses. Because the excuse will allow your situation to be done. It will allow your situation to be dead. Because you took too long waiting for him to come to you. You got to go to Jesus. It says... When the man heard, when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son. I know you get tired of begging, but you got to go and beg. You got to beg like your life depends on it. You got to beg like your child depends on it. You got to beg like your finances depend on it. You got to beg like your healing depends on it. You got to beg like your life depends on it, like your family depends on it. You got to beg and come in with, listen to this. It says, who was close to death? He wasn't dead yet. Oh my God. Somebody say, I'm not dead yet. My sister not dead yet. My child not dead yet. My family not dead yet. My situation not dead yet. Your child is not dead yet. Unless, verse 48, Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. I hope that I testify enough of my signs and wonders that you believe enough to come to him. That you believe enough to say, I want to be saved. That you believe enough to be willing to drop down on your knees and beg for yourself. He said, I know you a royal official. And I know you need to see the sign and the wonders. So guess what? I'm not going to go. I'm not going to move my feet. I'm going to tell you, sir, come down. Before my child dies is what the man said to Jesus. He said, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said, I'm not coming down. I don't have to. All I got to do is speak a word. Somebody say, speak a word. He said, go. And your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. How many of you are taking Jesus at his word? You got to take him at his word. 
How do you take Jesus at his word? You listen to ministers of the gospel. You listen to the word of God. You, you turn on YouTube. You turn on Facebook. You go into the church. You listen to people and take the, them at their word. You got to study the word of God. And if the word don't line up with your spirit, eat the meat and spit out the bones, but take the word and receive it. I taught y'all this, that when somebody speaks a word over life, over your life, you say, I receive it in the name of Jesus. This man received the word. He didn't go back and forth with God. He said, I received the word and he left. When you get off this live today and you know you need God like never before, you say, whatever Reverend Rashida said today, I receive it in the name of Jesus for my child, for my household, for my family, for my relationship, for my marriage, for my finances, for my business, for my house. Whatever it is that you need God to do for your grandchildren, you say, I receive it in the name of Jesus and you depart. While he was still on the way, his servants met him. Now, he could have sent his servants, but he went himself. His servants met him with the news that the boy was living. He was about to die, but they ran to him and said, can you believe it? He's living. He's not sick anymore. He's alive. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign of Jesus Christ performing after coming from Judea to Galilee. I want to say to you today, I want to speak it to your life today, that your son will live. Your daughter will live. Your grandchild will live. Your husband will live. Your wife will live. Your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your niece, your cousin, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, your grandmother, your grandfather. They will live in the name of Jesus at 807 today. On this Sunday, I decree and declare in the name of Jesus by the power invested in me that your loved one will live. They will not die, saith the Lord. They shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Your son will live and not die. Your son will not die on the streets. Your son will not die by the hands of the enemy. Your son will not die by gun violence. Your son will not die before he's married. Your son will not die before he raised a family. Your son will not die with prostate cancer and heart disease and, and lung disease. Your son will not die for substance abuse. He will not die by homelessness. Your son will not die for lack of support. Your son will not die for drugs and alcohol, for popping pills. Your son will not die for smoking weed. Your son will not die. He will live in abundance. Your son will live under the protection of the Holy Spirit. Your son will live according to the promise that God has given. Your son will live and work and sweat from the brow. Your son will live and be the head of the household. Your son will live and be the king of the house. Your son will live and be a leader. Your son will live and be a royal priesthood. Your son will live and be a conqueror. Your son will live and be prosperous. Your son will live and be a husband. Your son will live and be a father. Your son will live and be a great brother. Your son will live. Somebody say hallelujah. Your son will live. He will not die. Your child will live. You will live because of the power that's inside of your mother. Because of the power that's inside of your father. Because of the power that's inside of your loved one. Your son will live. Your son will live. Your daughter will live. You got to speak over your loved ones. You got to speak over your children. 
You cannot. You cannot. Let them die. To the hand of the enemy. His job is to kill. Steal. And destroy everything that's attached to you. But you got to believe. That you have faith as small as a mustard seed. That you can move that mountain. That mountain can be moved. In the name of Jesus. And it's possible. It is possible. So your child. Will live. And declare the works. Of the Lord. Your child will live. Hallelujah. Your child will be healed. Your child will be delivered. Your child will be set free. Your child. Will be able to testify. And say it was because of Jesus Christ. Your child. Will be the one. That to say. That if it wasn't for. The Lord on my side. Where would I be? Your child will live. Most gracious and eternal Father, we bless your holy and righteous name. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your Holy Ghost boldness and power. We thank you, God, that you continue to be a fence all around us. Father, we thank you for our children. We thank you, even our adult children. God, we thank you for our adult children. We thank you for our little children. We thank you for our family members. God, we thank you for everyone that is attached to us. God, we ask you for your healing power to be inside of us that we can lay hands on our own children and declare that they will be healed because of your blood. We know that your blood still works. But God, we need to see you wonder, we need to see a sign. We need to see the miracle. We need to see it with our own eyes. Even though faith says it is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Father, we need to see the healing power on somebody else's child. We need to see it. So, Father, we ask you to show up. Show up in our household. Show up in our children. Show up, God. Show up like never before. Father, we love you today. We honor you. We thank you. We lift you up. We invoke your presence. We thank you for the Holy Ghost, God. We thank you that we are filled with the power inside of us that can remove any mountain. Whatever mountain that is up against us in this day. Father, we ask you before June 1st come to show up. Show up like never before. We love you today. We thank you. And we honor you. I know that somebody might be on here that do not know Jesus Christ as a part of their sins. And I actually just say this short prayer. If you want to know Jesus Christ and you want to be saved, just say this short prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. And I believe you came to earth. And I believe you died on the cross with me. And I believe you shed your blood for me. Right now, I come to you, Lord Jesus, because I am a sinner. Cleanse me with your blood. Make me clean so that I can be clean. Save my soul. I no longer belong to Satan. I belong to you. I am forever yours. And I am now saved. Oh, God. God bless you. I love you guys. Thank you so, so much for being amazing. For being wonderful. I hope that this healing series helped you. I hope that you can take some time today and write down the names of the people that need healing. Write down your goals, your, your visions. What do you need from God? I want you to be specific about what it is that you need from God. I want you to be very, very mindful of your words from here on out. Be mindful of what you're speaking in the earth. Be mindful of what you're speaking in the atmosphere. I need you to speak life over your children. 
I need you to speak life over your own life. Speak life that you will be happy. Speak life that you will be joyful. Speak life that you will be loving. Speak life that you will no longer be angry. Speak life that you will be gentle and kind. I need you to ask God that you can heal me. You can heal my heart. And I no longer have to feel guilty about anything else. I don't have to apologize for anything else. I don't have to explain myself no more. It's in your words. You have power in your words. So I hope that this healing series blessed you as it did bless me. We will go on to the next series. I will be doing the series on forgiveness next, um, next week. I love y'all. I love y'all so much. God bless you. I pray that God touches your household. I pray that the Holy Spirit has moved you today as he has moved me. I pray that he will give you the desires of your heart and that he will continue to cover you in every area that you're longing for. I love y'all. I thank you. Please share this live. <clears throat> Please let somebody know that Jesus is Lord and that he heals, that he delivers, and he sets free. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. <clears throat> and may he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you. <clears throat> I love you. And have a blessed week. I'll see y'all next Sunday. <clears throat>